Bonjour. Qui j'aouille? Let's talk about death. I know this is a very difficult subject, but I think that we can get through this together. Every culture on Earth has developed their own way to interact with the concept of death. Death is everywhere, all around us. It is an industry. It is a medical condition with a certain finality. And perhaps it is even a state of mind. Many cultures around the world have gone so far as to personify this universal constant, creating, invoking, and some would say worshipping figures who represent death. Hades, Azrael, Abaddon, Apollyon, Yam, Anubis, the list goes on. And hey, what do you know? That's where I come in. Why don't you stay a while? Have another glass of rum. Light up another cigar. Stick around for one more dance. One more track on the record. It's a dead man's party after all. There's nothing to be afraid of. So let's begin. <clears throat> you are going to die. Nope, nope, nope. That's coming on too strong. Pretty bad way to start a conversation. Let's, uh, let's try this again. So, the human condition is terminal. Your physical conscious existence is temporary. None of you get out of this alive. Your time might not come today, or tomorrow, or this year, but it will come. Sadly, there's been a lot of death around us recently, and I don't see a lot of people having the conversations that they should be having. Could it be that this concept frightens people? Why are people so afraid of death? Many have posited that it is a fear of the unknown. Where religions can give you the reassurance of spiritual eternity, medical texts can explain the chemical functions of expiration, and our own experience with those who have passed can provide some insight. But ultimately, there is no way of knowing what you specifically will experience when the lights go down. Perhaps we are afraid of pain or discomfort in our last moments, some future trauma that we don't want to look forward to. So we banish the thought. There is the fear of the emotional pain that can come from feelings of loss and mourning when a loved one is lost. These can stop someone from confronting the stark reality of death. Ultimately, all of this can work in concert to make us actively avoid thinking about the time when our own credit sequence begins. Unfortunately, this fear has consequences. Many people are too afraid to confront the subject to make appropriate end-of-life plans, resulting in financial and emotional distress and uncertainty for the grieving family and friends. Many don't take the opportunity to make decisions about their own health in advance of their final curtain call. Over 50% of adult Americans don't even have a will. This often leads to financial decisions involving lengthy and stressful dealings with courts and state governments and in the worst case scenarios, family drama. These can be uncomfortable conversations to have on the best of days, made all the worse by the fact that they often have to take place during times of illness or societal turmoil. And sadly, there is a whole industry nearby, ready and waiting to profit off of our fear-induced lack of planning. I want you to think for a second. Visualize this in your mind, if you will. Imagine the worst used car salesman you have ever spoken to. Down to his cheap, ugly suit, his expensive haircut, and spit-polished shoes. Can you see it in your mind? Good. Now imagine having to talk to someone like that while you are actively grieving. You are lost, confused, uncertain, sad, angry, and now you are thrust into a hard sell transaction with a representative of a roughly $20 billion industry. Have you ever thought about how strange it is that people will often buy a coffin for a corpse that's more comfortable than the bed they sleep in? Have you ever considered how strange it is that hundreds or thousands of dollars is spent to pipe a body full of toxic chemicals and then paint it with cake makeup and then prop it up on blocks in unnatural poses just to make a cadaver presentable for a few hours before it gets chucked in the ground or thrown in an incinerator? 
Up until recently, there were very few options to choose from when it came to laying the remains of your loved ones to rest. And like most cold, indifferent for-profit industries, there was little to no care given for the desires of those who were not white, cishet, and Christian. Your choices were usually a church or a private funeral home that looked a lot like a church on the inside. The sad truth is that due to the increasing struggle younger generations are facing when working towards financial security, oftentimes when someone under the age of 30 passes away, their parents are usually the only ones with the means to finance burial. Trans deceased are often buried under dead names and in misgendered clothing. A number of an indigenous and diaspora cultural practices were outlawed in lieu of sanitized Christian Eurocentric burials. To this day, almost every municipality has a ban on open funeral pyres. And this is a real shame, because I think that they could stand to learn a thing or two about celebrating the life of the deceased from other cultures. European funerals are boring, maudlin affairs that hyper-focus on the feelings of loss and sorrow, wearing all black as the sound of sobs fills the air. Now, no shade to my non-melanated audience, but take notes here. Oh, you knew this was coming. This video made the rounds a little while ago of a funeral service where pallbearers performed a coordinated dance number through the streets while taking the deceased to their final resting place. This took place in Ghana, and I can't tell you how much I love this video. If the people of Ghana decide that their last wish is not to be wept over in a sorrow-filled chamber before being door dashed to a hole in the ground in an ugly, oversized car with curtains on the windows, but to instead become the marshal of their own fucking parade, who am I to stop them? It's not uncommon for many cultures in the global south to praise the deceased with a feast and celebration, giving positive memories and new life to their legacy. In Latin American culture, Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead, is well known as an annual holiday where the spirits of their ancestors are invited to feast with the living, also inspiring some truly evocative art and motifs. And in Haitian voodoo, the death loa are invoked with music and dancing and all white clothing and plenty of rum. You'll find, even among the African diaspora in North America, it's not uncommon for black churches to have a much more upbeat affair during the memorials for the deceased. There will be choruses, dancing, and glorious praise. Many refer to these as a sending home. And isn't sending someone home a reason to celebrate? You'd think that the business of laying deceased people to rest with respect and dignity would also take great pains to avoid killing the planet. But you'd be wrong. Brutally cruel irony. Embalmers use toxic chemicals that endanger them with long-term exposure. These chemicals can also affect the soil and groundwater from decomposing bodies and coffins. The business of making coffins is responsible for massive CO2 emissions and deforestation. The amount of wood needed to create caskets is equivalent to 4 million square acres of forest, which contains enough trees to sequester 65 million tons of carbon dioxide a year. The amount of wood used in casket making can supply the wood needed to build over 90,000 homes. Conventional burials in the U.S. use 30 million pounds of hardwood, 2,700 tons of copper and bronze, 104 1,272 tons of steel and 1,636,000 tons of reinforced concrete for burial vaults and caskets. The sheer amount of materials used is staggering. If every person gets a standard 7 foot by 3 foot grave plot, this means that 1,161,300,000 square feet or 41.66 square miles of habitable or arable land is now solely devoted to graveyards every year. And this number is only growing as our world population continues to grow. The good news is that there are now organizations dedicated to environmentally friendly and carbon negative means of laying your loved ones to rest with respect and dignity. But this feels so very cold 
and mathematical, and the subject deserves more than that. We need to explore the more metaphysical side of this. Right now, the biggest drivers of death among humanity, war and disease, rage on as they always have. Both of these categories are peaking before our very eyes, but the most prominent voices are not willing to swallow their fear of the subject to actually speak on the human toll that this loss of life is causing. Everyone viewing this will, at some point, die. This is an objective truth. What's important is determining whether or not these deaths are necessary. Are they preventable? Are they indicative of some societal or structural failure? So much coin passes through the fingers of titans of industry, and yet people die while life-saving food, medicine, and shelter are locked behind doors, only accessible with said coins. We have a tendency to try to avoid or try to shut down conversations about death. It can be a heavy topic, but we need to talk about it more and more and in those conversations we need to make sure that if there is a responsible party for untimely deaths they are held accountable and the blame is applied properly i have no dog in this fight every person buried in the soil is but another party guest for me but you absolutely should be doing what you can to make sure that more bodies aren't fed into the carnivorous machinations of industry or war so let's answer the burning question that you've probably had this whole time. How does one cheat death? It's actually pretty simple. You've been doing it this whole time. You did it today without even trying. You cheat death by living. You, yes you, are a powerful insurgent against all of the forces of this world conspiring to keep you down. Tomorrow isn't promised. And by waking up today, you are staging a one-person insurrection against the cruel and indifferent forces of this world. By waking up, rising to your feet, and starting your day, you have cheated death and fired the first round in your pitched battle against the brutal hierarchies that surround you. So the question you should be asking is, what should one do with this borrowed time? Thank you for joining me.